כן. אוקיי? כן. So thank you very, very much now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the, uh, the support. טרם יקראו ואני אענה. I didn't even request and already I'm able to share the screen. So, uh, with no, so we're starting our learning this year. Uh, in, our, in this week's Parsha, we read Lo uh, Bashamayim Hi. Okay, it is not in heaven. And I want to talk about this topic um, in the context of tshuva and other relevant things. So with no further ado, let's uh, just start. I'll share with you the screen of the sources and we'll start learning together. Baruch Hashem. So there we go. Um, we read in our parsha the following uh, paragraph. Ki ha-mitzvah zot, because this mitzvah, asher anochi mitzvah hayom, lo nifleti mimcha velo rechokahi. As this mitzvah that I'm commanding you today is not uh, elevated away from you, and it's not, it's not distance from you. Lo b'shamayim hi. It is not in heaven, this mitzvah, uh, saying that uh, as if someone could have said, who will climb to the sky and will take it for us and uh, and then will read it to us and uh, we will do it. It is not that way. This mitzvah is not distant from you. It is not in heaven. And it's also not beyond the seas. It's not further away behind the ocean. Uh, as if someone would say, who will go over across the ocean and will take it for us and will read it to us and will hear it and will do it. It's not it's not distant, it's not in heaven. Rather, it is close to you, it is near to you, this thing is close to you, it's in your mouth and in your heart to do it. You have the ability to do it with your mouth and your heart. This is the paragraph, okay? It is a very, very famous quote, it is not in heaven. Now, what is it referring to? You know, when, when we learn, in, uh, when, we learn uh, when we have an unseen, uh, let's say in our Bagrut, you know, I'm an Israeli, so we had a finals in English. So you're asked all kinds of questions. The word uh, who refers to, yeah, you need to know what it is what, what in the paragraph. Some words, who are they referring to? So let's say here it's written, ki ha mitzvah hazot, here I'll show you. Lo nifle, lo b'shamayim hi. So, who is the he? Who is the she? Lo b'shamayim hi. What is it said that is not, not in heaven? In terms of grammar here, Hebrew grammar, what, what the word lo b'sh, the word he refers to, I'm asking everybody, it's an easy question. The word, okay, maybe I, it's not, it's not smart that I stopped sharing the screen. You want to look at it. So, yeah, everyone sees the screen? Okay, so the word he, lo b'shamayim he, it is not in heaven. This word it, lo b'shamayim he, it refers to what? What is not in heaven? The mitzvah. The mitzvah. Great, absolutely. The, 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 the beginning of the paragraph is ki ha mitzvah hazot, because this mitzvah that I'm commanding you today is not far from you. It is not in heaven. No one needs to climb to the sky and bring it to you and read it to you. Rather, it's close to you, it's in your heart and in mouth, in your mouth and heart to do it. So it's the mitzvah. So now my next question will be, what is this mitzvah? What is this mitzvah? What are we talking about? What is not in heaven? Unclear. Unclear. Shuvah. Shuvah. So please, uh, now we're in the, so take your educated guesses or, or interpretations. It says that this mitzvah is not in heaven. What? Tshuva. Tshuva? Why do you say tshuva, Michael? Mitch. It's, it's the last thing that we were talking about. Right. So one option to say that we're talking about the tshuva. And why? Because as we'll see soon in the source sheet, the previous paragraph was talking specifically about tshuva. What are the other options? After all, it's... A, it, it is still, even though it appears right after the paragraph of tshuva, but it's an, it appears as an independent paragraph. So what's the other option? Torah kulo. All the Torah, right. Because yeah. many times in, in, in the Torah, when it says 
Shamor et ha-mitzvah, or ki ha-mitzvah, even though it's written in its singular, in singular, mitzvah, but it really means mitzvot, yeah? Ha-mitzvah hazot, meaning the entire mitzvot. Okay, so that's the second option. Now, why not just say simply like Mitch, that it refers to the previous paragraph? There is a reason for it, okay? It, it, there is a pshat, there are pros and cons in terms of pshat to each approach, as we'll see. Okay, let's now uh, uh, see what the commentators, the Rishonim, uh, are saying about this. So Rashi, let's see how Ra what does Rashi understand? What is not in heaven according to Rashi? According to Rashi, what's not in heaven is the entire Torah. Yeah, Rashi says, Ki karov since the Torah was given to you both written and oral, so it is accessible. So it refers, obviously, to the entire Torah. Actually, Rashi, even, Rashi doesn't even talk necessarily only about the mitzvot. He talks about the Torah, maybe also Talmud Torah, the entire thing. Let's see the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra refers to the Beficho Vilvavcha. What do we mean by, because the last verse in the paragraph that I also put in bold letter, bold letters, this thing is close to you, it is in your heart and in, in, in your mouth. So what does it mean in your mouth and your heart? So Ibn Ezra says, because the, the main focus regarding mitzvot, after all, if you don't have the kavana, the, uh, then what did you really do? Are you a robot? So kol mitzvot ikaram balev, that's bilvavcha. V'yesh mehem zecher bapeh v'chizuk alev. And some, you need to recite some uh, uh, words like kiddush, abdallah, davenings, all kinds of things, the, our commandments that you're doing with your mouth. But here Ibn Ezra, and that's a position, not everyone agrees, he says, Actually, it says, the focus, he claims, that the main thing is the lev, as a rationalist. I mean, the main thing is the kavona. And some, and some are said in the mouth in order to strengthen the heart. The yeshma say, and, there, and, some, and some mitzvot even requires actions. A lot of mitzvot, like taking a lulav, lulav eating a matzah, putting on tefillin. And, and there is an action so that he will say in the mouth, and then it will go into the heart. So I'm not, look, it's here in very, very few words, Ibn Ezra uh, um, actually says a position that is very controversial about how much really the target of everything is the heart. Not everyone agrees with it, but for our discussion, for the sake of our discussion, it doesn't matter. What I wanted to take from the Ibn Ezra is one very little thing, is that he clearly understands in Pshat, Ibn Ezra, Ibn Ezra clearly understands like our second parish, not like the, what Mitch offered, that it refers to tshuva. Rather, Ibn Ezra says clearly, kol karam alev, meaning that this whole paragraph is referring to the entire mitzvot, the entire commandments. Now let's see the Ramban. Ramban says, v'tam ki ha-mitzvah hazot, here, I'm, I'm with the cursor, V'tam ki ha-mitzvah hazot al kol ha-Torah kula. Actually, what does it mean, ha-mitzvah hazot? All the Torah. So Ibn, Ramban's first interpretation is like Ibn Ezra and Rashi. That till now, Haverim, till now, what did we see? <clears throat> till now, we didn't see even one position saying that it's the mitzvah of tshuva. Till now, we saw only both Rashi, Ibn Ezra, and Ramban, all of them agreed that it talks about the entire mitzvot. It's not in heaven. It is accessible to you. It was referring to all the mitzvot. That's what Rashi says, Ibn Ezra says, and Ramban says. But here Ramban offers another parish. After he mentioned Ibn Ezra and Rashi's parish, Tam ki mitzvah zot al kol ha-Torah kula. But then he says, Vehanachon. But the correct interpretation in my eyes, says the Ramban. Indeed, Ramban says sometimes when it says ha-mitzvah, it is referring to all the mitzvot. And that was way, way behind in Perek Chet. There was a verse, yeah, we're now in Perek Lamed. So, mamash in Parshat Ekev, 
it was said, or if I kola mitzvah shara nochi mitzvah yom, all the mitzvah that I'm commanding you today, there, in this verse says, Ramban, it indeed referred to the entire mitzvah, but ha mitzvah hazot, he makes a grammar distinction. He says, when it says kol ha mitzvah, then it refers to the entire mitzvah, but, but here it says, ki ha mitzvah hazot shara nochi mitzvah yom. So Ramban points out to the fact that there is this word, hazot, and this, it's a specific. And since it's specific, he says, no, it's not the entire mitzvot. The paragraph is referring to tshuva. Aval ha-mitzvah hazot al ha-tshuva ha-nizkeret. Ki ve-ashevot al-avavecha ve-shavta ad-ashem al-okecha. These are previous psukim that were just before this paragraph of it is not in heaven. Mitzvah shi itzave otanu la-asot ken. When it says, and you will return to your heart, or and you will return till Hashem, your God. This is a commandment. So there is a commandment to do tshuva. And now the Ramban needs to, uh, um, there is a certain problem with his parish. In order to understand the problem with his parish, let's, um, um, for a minute, living the Ramban, leaving the Ramban, we'll return to him. Let's now read indeed the paragraph. Look at that. It's Varim Paraklamet Pasuk Aleph. Just to remind you, we started with Varim Paraklamet Pasuk Yud Aleph. So we're really talking few psukim before the Pasuk, it is not in heaven. And in, in, it is not in heaven before the Pasuk, Ki Ha Mitzvah Hazot, because this mitzvah is not far, is not in heaven. So let's see the paragraph that was right before it. Vehaya, and it will be when. All these things will come to you, the, the, the blessing and the curse that I placed in front of you. You see, I, I bolded the, the, the critical words here. And you will return to your heart. When will you do it? Or you'll take it into account to your heart. Where? When you will be in Galus, when you will be around the Goyim that Hashem spread you there. And then what will you, will you do when you'll take things to your heart? You will return till Hashem your God. These are, this is the paragraph in the Torah of Tshuva. Yeah, when you will be miserable amongst the Goyim, then at a certain point you will take things into your heart and then you will return till Hashem your God and then you will listen to His voice just as I command you today. You and your, and your children with all your heart and all your nefesh. And then in exchange, when you, once you return to Hashem, and then Veshav Hashem Elokecha, the same root, Veshav, Hashem will return your exile, the people that are in exile, and He will have mercy on you, and He will gather you from all the nations that He spread you out there. Okay, and then there are a few more psukim. I skipped some, and then the atatashuv, and you will return, and you will you will return to Hashem, and you will listen to His voice, and you will do all of the mitzvot that He is commanding you today, and then Hashem will bless you, and will give blessing in all of your uh, work, and with your and with children, and with uh, property, and with your fruits, because Hashem will return again. He will return to do good to you. Uh, and be happy with you just like he was happy with your fathers. And then the last pasuk, because you will hear the voice of Hashem, your God, to keep his mitzvot and his laws uh, that are written in this Sefer Torah, ki tashuv el Hashem, because you will return to Hashem, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. And then right after it, this is pasuk yud, there is ki ha mitzvah, so right after it, because this mitzvah that I'm commanding you, it is not in heaven. So look, in this paragraph that was right before the paragraph of it is not in heaven, we see here, one, that we see uh, two, three times that it's written that we will return to Hashem, and that in exchange Hashem will return to us, or He will restore again our good situation. He will bring back our people from the exile, he will be again happy with us. So the theme is tshuva. So naturally, Ramban says, so if it says, 
right after this paragraph, Ki HaMitzvah Hazot, Asher Anochi Metzavcha Hayom, probably this Mitzvah Hazot is the Mitzvah of Tshuva. And Ramban assumes that there was a commandment, one of the Taryag, a positive commandment that if you sin, to do Tshuva. And where, what is the source of this positive commandment to do Tshuva? These verses, Veshavta Hashem Elokecha, you will return to Hashem, Ve'atatashuv, and you shall return to Hashem, Kitashuv, because you will return, etc. So now I'm asking the crowd here, the, uh, the Kahala Kadosh, that is listening to me. I'm asking a simple question, Haverim. Is it, uh, isn't, it is indeed, do you see here in this paragraph, that was right before the paragraph of Loba Shamaimi, do you indeed see here a commandment to do tshuva? Is there a commandment to do tshuva written here? Shot. No. Who said no? I did. Okay, so Phil, why do you say no? You don't see it as a command. It's a, a prediction of what's going to happen. Absolutely. Phil, if we read Pshat, this is a story. This is a narrative. It is not a commandment. God is telling us, or Moshe is telling us in the name of God, when you will be uh, uh, in the exile, at a certain point you will take things into your heart, and then you will return to Hashem, and then Hashem will redeem you. It's just telling us the future. So it's very encouraging. There is a promise here that at a certain point in the Gullus, Hashem promise, promises that at a certain point in the Gullus, we will do tshuva and he will restore our ideal position. It's, a, it's very encouraging. It's a, it's a promise. But then, since it's written in this way as a promise, not as a commandment, look, and you will return to Hashem. And then, and you will return. And then at the end, uh, because you will return to Hashem. It doesn't say, Shuvel Hashem. Yeah? There is no, even when it's written here, Ve'atata Shuv, it's not a commandment. It's part of a story. Okay? So, uh, therefore, when, Ram, when, when um, uh, Mitch offered beforehand that Ki HaMitzvah Hazot is actually, Ki HaMitzvah Hazot is actually referring Excuse me? Yeah, that Kiyah Mitzvah Azot is actually referring to the mitzvah of tshuva. And why? Because it was said in the previous paragraph, well, people will claim, no, it wasn't written as a commandment. Therefore, I must interpret Kiyah Mitzvah Azot like Rashi and Ibn Ezra interpreted. That Kiyah Mitzvah Azot is just a general statement regarding all the mitzvahs that were commanded. So first of all, we understood now why Rashi and Ibn Ezra Despite the fact that it that this paragraph is right after the paragraph about tshuva, why they interpreted it, it is not in heaven and all of this, as referring to the entire mitzvot. However, Ramban wants to interpret it, dafka to tshuva. And why? Because of what Mitch said. Because indeed, Ramban says, I can't ignore the fact that this thing is written boom, right after a paragraph of tshuva, and furthermore, it says Hamitzvah uh, Hazot, uh, alluding to something, uh, uh, um, something uh, specific. Okay, so Ramban, but Ramban now will have to answer. Ramban will have now to answer. Just one second, I want to see. There was a, a, a someone wrote here something in chat, so I'll see. Yeah. Uh, and, but I think always we, 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 we try to answer why is it that way. So you'll see why Ramban, Ramban indeed tries to answer it. And Malasot, here it's not written as a commandment at all. It's written just as what will happen in the future. It's not only a narrative. Make, make is written as a story, but it's in the context of commandments. Here it's a story telling you the future. Not necessarily a commandment. Ramban is troubled by that question. And Ramban is saying the following thing. Ramban is says, mm -hmm. Here, I'm now, you see, I'm in the fourth row in the Ramban. It was written in present tense to hint us that it's a promise, that this is the way it will be. 
And the reason for that, because even if you're spread and you're far away, you will still be able to return to Hashem because there is nothing far from you, but rather it is close to you every place and everywhere. Ramban says, look, it is a commandment. In the previous paragraph, when it says, V'shavta Hashem Elokecha, V'shavta Hashem Elokecha is a commandment. When it's written, V'shavta Hashem Elokecha, it is a commandment, says Ramban. And therefore, when it says in the next paragraph, this mitzvah is not in heaven, it refers to tshuva. And Ramban says there is a need to, re to write it as a promise, as an encouragement, because it wants to stress that even when you're far, even when you're very far from Hashem, you're not in Eretz Yisrael, even when you're amongst the Goyim, and the circumstances to do tshuva are the hardest ones, God in encourages us that even when you're in the hands of the nations, you could still do tshuva and do all the commandments because it's not far from you. It is close to you everywhere, every place, every situation. You're always able to do it because you, Hashem is always close to you. And that's the reason for this special encouragement. Because it is close to you, it is in your heart and in your mouth. And he says here, as he says here, what is Beficha Uvilvavcha? You remember when Ibn Ezra interpreted it as referring to all the mitzvot. So he says, some mitzvot is in the, in the heart, some is in the action, la'asoto, some are in the action, some are in the mouth, some are in the heart. Comes Ramban and interprets this pasuk as referring specifically to tshuva, and that's easy. The, the mouth, what is the mouth regarding tshuva? Vidui. Vidui, exactly. So he says, She tvadu et avonam ve et avon avotam befiem. And then the heart, ve yashuvu belibam el Hashem. You do the tshuva in the heart. And you will accept the Torah to do it for generations. Okay. So we have, we have here two approaches. Is whether it is not in heaven and it is uh, a, a easy to do, whether it refers to uh, uh, tshuva, or it refers to the entire mitzvot. Now, let's explain the significance of it. Ramban already gave us a clue why it's so significant. We're now in the days of, of, of Elul. We're a week and a half before Rosh Hashanah. Tshuva seems to be a very, very hard task. I mean, someone who tries to do tshuva seriously. It seems something extremely hard. So the Torah needs to encourage you and tell you, look, it is not as, it is indeed hard, but it's complex. It's also easy. You know, when you take the decision, uh, you should know, Hashem is close to you. Hashem is close to you. And therefore, lo vashamaymi. You think that it's in heaven to do tshuva? No, we're telling you clearly, lo vashamaymi. Tshuva that seems to you so, so hard, it is not that way. This is the interpretation according to Ramban. Now, is it a commandment to do tshuva? This is a big machlokas, by the way. Ramban here takes a position that indeed, one of the 613 commandments of tshuva uh, 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 in the Torah is to do tshuva. However, there is a machlokis between achronim and the interpretation of, Bram, of Bramba, Maimonides, whether tshuva is a mitzvah. Rav Soloveitchik learned Rambam that he agrees with Ramban that it is a tshuva, that it's a mitzvah. However, Ramban, the Rambam himself, and that's the reason why some achronim understood that according to Rambam, only vidu is tshuva. When you do tshuva, then you have a mitzvah to do it in a form of a vidui. But the tshuva itself is not a mitzvah. And apparently, according to their opinion, you can't command to do tshuva. Tshuva is something that is totally a thing that depends on will. It's kind of oxymoron to command it. That's one approach why it's not a commandment. Or one will say, I can't count it as a commandment because it's something that is referring to the entire Torah, it's mitzvah kolelet, what we call. It's, a, it's something that is inclusive of the entire Torah. 
this way or that way, we have your two approaches regarding whether low, the term, the famous term, it is not in heaven, rather it's close to you, it's in your heart and your mouth to do it, whether it refers to all the mitzvos or merely to tshuva. And if it's merely to tshuva, it has a special message for us in this time of the year. Now, let's learn a famous Talmudic story, and we'll see what approach did this Talmudic story take, and then we'll see that it's a little more complex than as it seems at first glance. It's an extremely famous story regarding it is not in heaven. Let's learn it, and I'll share with you also a new pshat uh, regarding this famous story. Let's read it together. It's a Gemara in Bava Nunte. There is a Mishnah. There is a Mishnah. The Gemara here quotes a Mishnah. Meaning, he cut it. Someone cut it into particles, into uh, 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 parts, blocks. Okay? Uh, you cut, uh, 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 it was, I'm just saying, we're talking about an oven. Okay? We have an oven, and the oven is. I won't say broken up. It, it is made out of uh, stones or out of, uh, I won't say stones, uh, 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 okay, um, uh, ceramic, whatever, uh, but it's parts. And he put cement between each part, meaning he built an oven from parts, okay? Rabbi Eliezer is purifying the oven. He says that this oven is not accepting Tuma, impurity, and therefore, if there are taharos, if there are things that are uh, pure, that are touching it, they're not becoming contaminated. And Chachamim Metamin, Chachamim said, though, uh, uh, these uh, taharot, let's say there is truma or kodshim, that are touching this uh, oven, they will become impure. V'zehu tanu roshalachnai. And this is the famous oven, this machloket between Rabbi Eliezer and the sages, is the famous oven that is referred, referred and its name, its special name, this oven that is made out of particles when you put cement, sand between them to connect them. This is the oven of the achnai. Now the Gemara asks, my achnai, what do we mean by achnai? So the Gemara answers, Amar of Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, the Amora Rav Yehuda, second generation of Amoraim, in the name of Shmuel, first generation of Amoraim. He says, why is it called Achnai? She kifu dvarim ke'achnazo v'tim'uhu. Because he surrounded this oven with a lot of words, a lot of arguments, like a snake. Achnai is a snake that goes round and round, and they impured it, meaning... Why is this oven called Tanuroshel Achnai, the oven of the snake that is going round and round? Because there was a big dispute regarding it. Rabbi Eliezer purified it, and Chachamim claimed that it's impure, and Chachamim brought a lot of arguments. They, they surrounded it with a lot of arguments, like this snake. That's the intro to the story, to the famous story. Now there is another Tanaic source. Anna. And here starts the narrative, Tana, the famous story of Loba Shamayim. Uh, the Tana says, at this day, Rabbi Eliezer replied all or made all the arguments, all the answers to the claims of the Chachamim. He said all the arguments of the world, and they were refusing to accept, it, accept it, all these arguments from them. Meaning, there was a big dispute, a big debate, whether this oven is pure or impure. Rabbi Eliezer said a lot of arguments and they were refusing to accept. They stuck to their position that this is a contaminated, an impure oven. But then after he gives them all of his arguments in halachic, their discourse, then he, go, he, he tries another approach. After he said all the answers, kol tshuvot shebaolam, all the answers, and all the arguments, after he finished all of his arguments of halacha, then he tells them, Amar lehem, if halacha is like me, then this um, haruv, will be. haruv is, um, okay, I forgot the word. Haruv? Hello? Carob. 
carob? Carob. Yeah. Fox so, carob tree. So charub, uh, this charub, it's a certain fruit tree, well proved. What happened when he said that statement? Look at that, magics, Harry Potter. Nekar charub mim komo me'ama. The tree that he's, look, just try to live the, the situation. Here they are next to the Beit Midrash, the, the sages and Rabbi Eliezer, arguing, saying halachic arguments, one to the other, back and forth. And then at a certain point when he sees that they're refusing to accept, Rabbi Eliezer says, you see this tree? Maybe they're in the base Midrash and there, there is a window open. You see this tree? If I'm right, if the halach is like me, this tree will prove my point. Right when he finishes saying that statement, Harry Potter, this tree is uprooted. Mea ma, a big, uh, let me tell you, it's much more than two meters, social distance. It's, it's, it's very, very far. It was just flu. All right. So it seems that heaven are supporting him, right? Some even claim that it was even, the miracle was even bigger. He said, this, this tree, this fruit tree will prove my point, and it was uprooted a whole bunch. Amrulo. But the sages are not that um, impressed by this. The sages are telling them, okay, you can't bring, when we're discussing your halacha, you can't bring the proof from this fruit tree. Hazar Vamal, but he doesn't give up. He, he says again, if the halacha is like me, then the water, amatamayim uh, uh, the, the river, yeah, uh, it will, will prove. Okay, the spring, the spring will prove. What happened? Just as he finished, completed his sentence, the, 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 the brick, the, the, um, the spring, Turn back. You did a U-turn. Did you ever see, you know, there is water floating in one way, and then all of a sudden, once he finished his sentence, it were, instead of going top down, they were starting going down up. Yeah? Uh, bottom up. Okay. So they're not impressed again, and they're telling him, we can't bring a proof. <clears throat> you sh uh, uh, there's no proof from the spring. Then he said again, if the Allah is like me, the walls of our Beit Midrash, we're now staying in a Beit Midrash, we're now arguing in a Beit Midrash, the walls of this building will prove my point. Then the walls starting falling down. Wow. And then Rabbi Yoshua, one of the sages that were arguing with Rabbi Eliezer, Ga'ar Ba'em, he rebuked them, the walls. He told them, if Talmidei Chachamim, if rabbis, if sages are arguing with halacha, what is it? What, this is not your business. So what did the walls do? They were starting already to fall. So they didn't fall totally because of the, the respect of Rabbi Yoshua. And they didn't fix themselves up again because of the uh, <coughs> of Rabbi Eliezer. And they're still bent, meaning... You know, the Pisa Tower, okay? So that's what happened there, the Pisa, meaning the walls were bending because they started to fall. Once Rabbi Eliezer said, if I'm right, the walls will prove my point. But when Rabbi Yeshua says, it's not of your business, then they stopped. Okay, then he returns again, Rabbi Eliezer. He doesn't give up yet. Okay, <laughs> they weren't impressed by the tree. They weren't impressed by the spring. They weren't impressed by the walls. So he says, if the Allah is like me, it will be proved from heaven directly. A heavenly voice came out and called. Why are you arguing with Rabbi Eliezer? You know that as Allah like him everywhere. Wow, that seems like a knockout. A heavenly voice is telling the sages, look, why are you arguing with him? He says it's pure. You're saying it's impure. He's not convincing you, but we're telling you he's right. Rabbi Yeshua now stands on his feet, on his legs, and he calls. And this is our verse from our Parsha. Lo basha Hello, it is not in heaven. 
Now the Gemara asks, what is Loba Shamaimi? What does he mean to say when he says Loba Shamaimi? A heavenly voice said that Allah is like Rabbi Eliezer. And he says, Loba Shamaimi. So Rabbi Yirmiya explains that Mora, because the Torah was already given on Sinai. And once it was already given on Sinai, we are not, um, we are not considering the bat kol, the heavenly voice. It is not, it is not a, an argument. Because you, Hashem, already wrote in Sinai, rabim lehatot, that we should follow the majority ruling. So the Torah was already given, and the rule was that when there is a dispute, we follow the majority ruling, and lo a, a heavenly voice, is not an argument. Then Rabbi Natan found Eliyahu Hanavi, Rabbi Natan found Eliyahu Hanavi, and he said, tell me, what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do at that time? Meaning when there was the heavenly voice saying, the halach is like Rabbi Eliezer, stop arguing with him. And Rabbi Yoshua stubbornly said, no, uh, we're not taking into consideration the heavenly voice because it's written in the Torah, Achare Rabim Lahatot, we should follow the majority ruling. So Rabbi Nathan is asking Eliyahu Navi, what did Kadesh Borchu do that way? So he answered him, Kadesh Borchu smiled and said, my sons were victorious over me. My sons were victorious over me. That's the end of the famous story. Okay, it's a famous story, and probably you heard all kinds of things about it, but I'll, I think I will give you a little different angle on it. I'll start with the simple questions, or first I'll ask you guys, what is the, do you have any questions over this story? Or what is the most troubling question in my humble eyes regarding the story and the message of the story? It's this regarding the signs of the help of Hashem and, and his bait them the mala. It just being very willful and the Rabbanut today would die before they would go on such a statement. Okay. I'm just I, I, I wanna I, I wanna comment on what Phil said. Uh, um, what is the problem? The message of the story, the simple reading. I'm talking pshat of the story. Then I'll tell you there are other commentators that deviated from the pshat exactly because of the problems that we'll present, okay? But if we read the simple message of the story, it seems very radical. Because, and why radical? Phil said, the Chachamim, the bottom line is that Rabbi Yoshua and the Chachamim are ignoring the fact that Hashem tells that the Allah is like Rabbi Eliezer. Now, what's the problem with the fact that they're ignoring that? Why is that? I'm, I'm asking a simple question. Why is it surprising that the message of the story that one should ignore such a heavenly voice? It means that the discipline of the Torah, it can be put aside by majority vote. I, I would even sharpen this door. I, I'll ask, you know, a prelim preliminary question. <laughs> like a very, very basic question I'll ask you. Why are we doing halacha? Why are we doing mitzvos? Why? Why are we doing mitzvos? The simple, simple answer. I'll give you a more complicated answer. We went into Golas and the Chacham and wanted to keep us busy. That's great. But I'm saying at, at the end of the day, I'll even say Torah Shebechtav. Okay, we have Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebechtav. And then we have 613 commandments. We believe that who commanded us these 613 commandments? Who commanded it, uh, us? Hashem. Nachon. So when I'm doing a mitzvah, the purpose of the purpose of shaking a lulav, there are a lot of kavanos and a lot of good things, but the basic, <clears throat> basic, I'm doing the will of Hashem. If Hashem wouldn't command me to, to take a lulav or to keep Shabbos, then I wouldn't do it, okay? At the end of the day, the, 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 the purpose of the mitzvot, at least the mitzvot that are bein adam lamakom, yeah, but the mitzvot are just avodas Hashem. Mitzvot are avodas Hashem. So wouldn't it make sense that the one that tells us that who is the halach according to is Hashem? Meaning, 
If Hashem is telling us that this oven is pure, and the pshat of the story, I stress, the pshat of the story is that a heavenly voice came out and said, Allah is Rabbi Eli like Rabbi Eliezer, stop arguing with him. That's the, the, the pshat of the story, okay? So if Hashem tells us that the truth is that this tanur, this oven is pure, or that Rabbi Eliezer is right, so what's the purpose of doing a wrong halacha? What are you doing halacha for? Just to waste your time. You're doing it to do God's will. When God, where God expressed his will. If God expressed his, his will, how can you ignore that? I'll sharpen the question. The end of the story says before the smile of Hashem, before the line about the smile of Hashem, one line beforehand, uh, there is an explication. The Gemara explains what does it mean, Lo It is not in heaven, therefore we're not paying attention to a heavenly voice because it was really, Hashem already gave us the Torah and, or, and, and Hashem Shekvar Katavta, you wrote, speak to Hashem, you already wrote in the Torah, follow majority ruling. Fine, I'm not arguing with that. All the sages are the heavenly voice. So now everyone knows the truth? Okay, let's take a vote. Taking into consideration the heavenly voice. And why taking it into consideration? Because that's Hashem's will. There's no justification not to take it into consideration. But the purpose of Allah is to do what Hashem, the truth is to do what Hashem wants. So no problem. It's written in the Torah that one should follow the majority ruling. Fantastic. All of us heard the heavenly voice. So now I take a vote. Let's all vote according to the truth, i.e. the heavenly voice. And we'll all decide according to majority ruling that the tunnel is pure, like Rabbi Eliezer. So I don't understand this. It's two separate things. The fact that you say we follow majority ruling, that has nothing to do with the fact that you're now telling me I ignore the heavenly voice because of it is not in heaven. What's the logic behind this? It doesn't make that, sense at all. I think that is is exactly what what you say. Meaning, all of the methods employed by Rabbi El, by Rabbi Eliezer were not were were not natural. Were against nature. Right. And the and even the batko is not a natural phenomenon. And I think the whole point of the story is to say that we cannot decide halakha based on incantations, based on uh, all kinds of uh, hocus pocus uh, that cannot occur, that are impossible to occur in the olam ha tivi that was given to, a, that was created by God. And therefore, the position of the chachamim is even a batkol it's not part of the natural world. And we decide halacha based on logic uh, that is founded in the world as we know it. And that that's how it has to happen. Uh, even though there may be people who feel that they have access to other worlds and other types of knowledge, uh, that's, that's not normative. And that that's kind of what the story is trying to bring out. Harold? I agree with you that that's what the, tor uh, the story is saying. There is only one problem that we need to, to, to explicate here, to further clarify and sharpen. Hocus pocus of this, fine. When Hashem tells you what is the truth, and all the sages heard that Hashem said, this is the truth, then why are we ignoring that if the purpose of us is to do what Hashem thinks is true. He's testing them. Now, Benny is saying testing. But look, this I see already. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll categorize the interpretations of this story to two groups. One group is so troubled by my question that it minimizes the radicalism of the story. And what Benny says is, one attempt to say, look, Hashem thinks that the truth is really like the sages. 
but he's testing them. Or another approach uh, we see in one of the interpretations of the morale and others, a bad call, a heavenly voice, is not really what Hashem thinks. Or another approach is to say, uh, it says, if you'll read carefully the words, they say, why are you arguing with Rabbi Eliezer? The halacha is like him everywhere, the whole makom. So they meant everywhere, but not necessarily here. <laughs> so all of these, I will call them apologetic interpretations, are exactly in order to minimize the, the radical message of the shot of the story. Can I give my <laughs> story? The shot of the story is radical. The shot of the story is that Hashem said, Hashem represented by the heavenly voice, that, that in this specific case, the truth is with Rabbi Eliezer, and yet still, because of lo bashamayimi, we ignore it, and we rule halacha according to the halachic discourse, logic halachic discourse between the rabbis here. Yeah. We could also say, because there was an argument, they were machmir. They basically said it was not, that it's not tahor. Uh, and if you say that, it would be simply a statement that there was doubt for all the reasons expressed. So it, it, was, it was not a, an essay, it was a lot essay. But look, again, Hashem told them that there is no basis for a chumrah when Hashem tells you that it's not valid. Okay? With all the respect, there is no basis for it. That's one. B, I think that it's not that simple to interpret here who is machmir and who is meikom. Because there are all kinds of uh, implications, whether the oven is pure or not pure, oh. that can twist it around. At any rate, I'm just saying, the message is radical and still needs a, a, a further explication. I agree with Harold that uh, Tachlis, what's written, and that's why I said there's a whole set of apologetic uh, uh, interpretations in order to avoid that radical conclusion, but the pshat is that not only that we don't follow magics, that's okay, we understand, but even when Hashem tells us, we have, a, a, and by the way, it's not one person that has access. All the sages heard that heavenly voice. We still believe that there is like a deal here. Hashem gave us the, the, the written Torah, and Hashem told us his will is that we are in charge of inter interpreting the oral Torah and only us. And he cannot intervene, even if in the heavenly star standards it's a mistake. So that's a radical conclusion. And we need to further explain if there is any logic in such a radical conclusion, which is the pshat of the story. So now, but but I'll go one I'll, I'll go one step backwards, and I'll ask: When Rabbi Yeshua says here in the story, "Lo bashamaimi." Is he referring to tshuva? You remember we started the shir with a machlokas, whether it's tshuva, lo bashamaymi, that's Ramban, or Rashi and Ibn Ezra, it's the entire Torah. It seems that the story here understands that lo bashamaymi is what? Not tshuva. Not tshuva, exactly. We're not talking here about tshuva. We're talking here about the entire Torah and, 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 and the trusha here is saying it's not in heaven. The pshat is the mitzvos are accessible to heat. Yeah, they're not in heaven. They're close to us. Here, the, the, the sages interpreted it is not in heaven, meaning the legislation of Torah Shabbat Peh, interpretation of legislation of Allah and Torah Shabbat Peh, of all the mitzvot is not in heaven. It is here. Okay? So, but it's definitely referring to the entire Torah not regarding keeping it, but regarding interpreting it and legislating it. Now let's go back to our source sheet in an attempt to further understand the story, especially according to its radical message. So first here, for the sake of time, I need to uh, go a little uh, quicker. Uh, the Gemara in Psachim brings a machlokis Beit Shammai and Beit Hilo. And the Gemara there regarding Kiddush, which bracha you say first, Kiddush of Shabbat night, first the Bor Pragafen or the bracha on Kedusha Shabbos, 
And the Gemara concludes, Be'alacha like Be'tilu. Now the Gemara says, what do you mean? The Gemara doesn't need to tell us that Alacha, that Be'tilu. We learn in the Gemara in Erevin that uh, regarding Machloket Be'it Shammai and Be'tilu, it says, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim ve'alacha ke Be'tilu. There is an heavenly voice saying that is Allah is like Beit Hillel. So what do we need? What do we need a, 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 a spe- specific ruling in the Gemara that Allah is like Beit Hillel? It's, it's superfluous. We know because there is a heavenly voice. <clears throat> the Gemara says, maybe this statement was written in the Gemara before there was the heavenly voice. But indeed, after the heavenly voice, there's no need for such a statement. And then maybe it's after the heavenly voice, but it follows Rabbi Yeshua's position that is saying that we are not paying attention in halacha, in terms of sikat halacha, to a heavenly voice. Why did I bring this Gemara? Because in this Gemara, you see explicitly that this thing, this radical concept that is brought in the Gemara in Bava Metzia as the bottom line of the story, <clears throat> that Rabbi Yoshua says, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu admits that my son were victorious, Meaning, the conclusion of the story in Bava Metziah that this is the way to go. We ignore heavenly voices in the practice of ruling halacha. Well, we see that this is controversial. In the Gemara Psachim, the first answer is that indeed, after a heavenly voice, there wouldn't have been any need to say that halacha is like Beit Hillel. Meaning, there is an opinion here in the Gemara Psachim, the first opinion, the first Ibayit Ema in the Gemara Psachim, is that, yes, when there is a heavenly voice, meaning when Hashem tells us what is the truth, then we follow it. And it makes sense, as I said. Okay? So I just want to first present that this famous statement, Lo Bashamayni, that is based on the story of Gemar Bava Metziah, is controversial. Meaning that the Gemara Psachim brings an opinion that we do follow heavenly voices, in ruling halachos. And actually, we can understand that, that, that position. The position that we further need to make an effort to understand is Dafka, the position that says that despite that Hashem tell, is telling us what is the halacha, we still ignore it. That requires an explanation. Okay, there is a Tosos here. Um, Obviously, Rabbi Yeshua holds, Rabbi Yeshua holds, we don't listen to bat call. Of course, Rabbi Yeshua holds that. That's the same Rabbi Yeshua. No, Rabbi Yeshua holds that we are not following a bat call. Right, I'm saying but, that's the same but, Rabbi Wait a minute. Yeshua, but, no, I, the, what I, I, there's no argument here. Rabbi Yeshua says we're not following a heavenly voice. It's written both in Baba Metzia and in Psachim. But the first opinion, the first Ibai Tema in the Gemara Psachim, Ibai Tema Kodem Bat call, this opinion holds that we do follow a heavenly voice. Simple as that. So we see that in the Gemara, we have two opinions regarding the matter. Simple. Okay. Okay. Now, Tosfos, okay, I, I think I'll skip, skip Tosfos because of the lack of time. It first says that Bakko went out only for the honor of Rabbi Eliezer. So that's like what I call the apologetic opinion. Then at the end, Didavka says that the opinion is that we anyhow are not following a bat call, even if it's a true thing. Now, look at the famous Sota Choshen. Sota Choshen was a giant, Rabari Leiba Cohen, the famous Acharon, interpreter of Choshen Mishpat in Shulchan Aruch, the Lumdish book that in all the yeshivas they're learning. So it's a very Lumdish book on Choshen Mishpat, but the Ksot writes an intro, and look at his famous intro to his book. Because of that, I said, I believe what I said, that the Torah was given and interpreted according to the ruling of the human brain, mind. And I will say, and we're relying only on our logic, halachic arguments. And this is the interpretation of pi ha-patcha bechokhmah v'torat chesed ha What is the meaning of the verse? She opened her mouth with wisdom, but a Torah of Chesed is on her, on her tongue because Torah Shabbat Peh was given according to the decision of the sages, even if it is not true. Look at that. Afal Pisha Eino Emet. Okay, that should be put in bold letters. I made here a mistake that it's not in bold letters. 
meaning the Torah is ruled according to what the Chachamim decide, even if it's not the objective truth. And that's why it's called Torah's Chesed and not Torah's Emet. Torah Chesed al because even if the decisions are not correct, as long as they were done in the proper procedure of halachic arguments and discourse, this is how we rule it. So the Tzot HaChoshen took the story and understood it in the radical message of it. Now, Chaverim, I want to give you some solution to all of the, to the question that I gave you. And then I'll show you even another thing that we said that the Gemara talks about the entire Torah that is not in heaven, not about Shuvah. I'll show you that it talks really about both in the deep meaning of it. I'm sharing with you an ingenious interpretation of this Gemara said by my Rebbe Rav Amital, Zecher Tzadik Levracha. All the interpretations of this story ignore what were they arguing about. Rav Amital connects the whole Agada to the beginning of the, the Gemara that we read together. You know, usually people even don't read it. I read it with you because I knew that I will share with you Rav Amital's interpretation. What were the first lines of the, the lines, the introductory lines before the story? Is what they were arguing about. They were arguing about an oven that was made with by pieces and was attached by sand. The pieces were attached by sand. Rabbi Eliezer purified the oven and the sages impure the oven. Now, what are the rules of Tuma and Tara? The rules are that if you have an unbroken, a complete, a wholesome, an unbroken vessel, utensil, then it could accept impurity, makabal Tuma. But if it's a broken vessel, then it cannot accept Tuma. Once the vessel, the utensil was broken, the oven was broken, it is pure, meaning it cannot accept, it cannot be, become impure. Apparently, says Rav Amital, the machloket between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua is a deep machloket. If I have an oven that was made by broken parts or by parts, do I consider it an unbroken oven? once it was attached by cement, by sand, or I say, no, no, no. A complete and unbroken oven is only an oven that is indeed complete and unbroken. But if it's attached by particles, by components, this is considered a broken oven and it cannot accept too much. Rabbi Eliezer says, I have high standards. I'm living in heaven. In my standards, once it is attached by pieces and it's not whole, pure whole, then that's already a broken utensil and it will be pure. It cannot accept Tuma. Rabbi Yoshua and the sages are saying it is not in heaven. Rabbi Eliezer, your standards are standards of heaven. Indeed, in heaven, this is a broken vessel. Indeed, in heaven, it is, this is considered a broken vessel. But the Torah is given to human beings. The Torah is given to human beings. And the job of oral Torah is to take the heavenly Torah and Hashem gave us the mission, gave the sages in Sinai the message, the, the, the mission to take this Torah and make it a Torah not of angels, a Torah of human beings. And in standards of human beings, this is considered a tunnel that is an unbroken tunnel. In standards of human beings, even if you take parts, and this is a mashal to tshuva, even when a person is broken into pieces, if we, a person even if he's broken into pieces, once he takes cement and he's attaching particles and builds something out of it, in human being standards, in heavenly standards, this is a broken thing. 
But in human beings standards, this is already considered already something unbroken. Okay? Something that is not broken. And this is regarding both the human being and the tanur. Now we understand the entire story perfectly. Now we understand that when the heavenly voice says, Halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer, it is a true statement. The heavenly voice is saying, yes, this is a broken oven. But the heavenly voice is speaking on heavenly standards. And Rabbi Yeshua is standing on his feet and he says, it is not in heaven. You're right, the heavenly voice. The halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer in terms of Shemaim. But in terms of the halacha of human beings, this is a not broken oven, okay? Because when a human being takes parts and attaches them, this, on human being standards, this is already a not broken entity. Lo bashamaimi, okay? And then Hashem smiles and says, Nitzchuni bana, yeah, we rule according to a majority ruling of human beings in human standards. This is the halacha of Torah Shebel Peh. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful interpretation, a genius one, because it's the only interpretation, A, that takes into account what is the topic that they were arguing about and connects it to the narrative, and B, it explains us why, on the one hand, without any apologetics, indeed the heavenly voice said that the objective heavenly truth is like it is the Allah of Rabbi Eliezer. There's also another kind of truth. It's the truth of Allah of Torah Shabbal Peh when the Torah is the Torah of human beings. And now when we reach this point, we can even see how wise, how smart is this narrative in the Gemara and Bava Metziah. Because I told you and all of you agreed with me that the story is talking about, the story is talking about Loba Shemaimi, when Rabbi, when Rabbi Yeshua calls Loba Shemaimi, Rabbi Yeshua is referring to the entire mitzvot and how do we interpret them? Like an oven, impurity, it doesn't have to do with tshuva. But now you see that in the depth of it, it talks about tshuva, as I explained, because actually what Rabbi Yeshua and the sages are saying, it is not in heaven, meaning <clears throat> because the Torah the tshuva, the Gemara says, the tshuva was created before the world was created. People cannot keep mitzvot at all if there's no concept of tshuva. Once Hashem decided to give the Torah to human beings, then Hashem decided at that moment, before even one person made a sin, that there will be tshuva in the world. Because we're not angels. There is a verse in, there is a verse in Kohelet. The verse in Kohelet says, there is no righteous person that will never sin. If the Torah would have given to angels, then maybe. But since the Torah was given to human beings, it is inevitable. Every person at one point of his life will fail. Kohelet acknowledges that. Now Hashem understood it, but Hashem said, okay, I want to create a world where I'm giving human beings the Torah, <clears throat> and I want to see that even if they fall, they, they know how to stand up, and they're encouraged, and they know that I'm close to them, and they know that it's not in heaven, and it's in their heart and their mouth to do it. And therefore, because of that, because tshuva is an inherent component that Bechlal, a precondition, tshuva is a precondition to giving Torah to human beings. That's what I'm explaining. And therefore, in human being standards, when one is broken and he's taking the pieces and attaches them, that must be considered already a not broken vessel, something that is accepted. Therefore, the basis for interpreting Anor as pure, as impure, the basis to, for the interpretation of the Chachamim, that it's an impure, that lo bashamaymi, the basis for, for interpreting that is really that the concept of tshuva. Therefore, you see how in a very, very deep way, 
in a very deep way, the story tells us that Loba Shemaimi is referring to the entire Torah, Ki HaMitzvah Zodeh, but it's also specifically, this is on the basis, the fact that human beings are interpreting the Torah according to <coughs> human being standards is, and that the standards of what is completeness of excellence are human being standards are not heavenly uh, standards. This is all based on Loba Shamaimi as referring to Chuba. Now I'll see. Uh, uh, so, in a very interesting way, Ravamital's uh, uh, interpretation here makes a link between Loba Shamaimi as referring to all the mitzvot and as referring to Chuba. I'll read now the chant. This is dangerous path as it opens door to conservative and reform Judaism. No way. We have uh, 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 the, the, the message of all the sages, and have you seen the Ktsota Choshen says it very, very explicitly, the Ktsota Choshen. We have the rules that we're giving on Sinai as to the 13 Midot and others as to how to interpret the Torah Shebechtav. And there is a very, very clear halachic procedure as to how to interpret the Torah Shebechtav. And what, and what the story says that the people that are in charge to interpret the Torah Shebechtav is the sages. And the considerations are halachic considerations and not heavenly voices. That's what's written here. This is very, very orthodox. Now, um, let's continue. I'll share the screen. We're almost done. Yeah. So here there's some sources that show you that this machlok is... I have two more minutes. So this machlok of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, I've, I've here, and we won't be able to go over all of this. There, we see it in other cases too. That Rabbi Eliezer is saying the heavenly standards. And Rabbi Yeshua says, yes, we are saying uh, 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 this, the Torah is Torah of human beings. There are several examples here in Tainus, in Sukkah, in Brachos. I want to go to the last source, the Gemara and Erevin. Actually, you know, I'll say just one source in this context. In the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah, there's a machloket. Rabbi Eliezer says that the world was created in Tishrei. We're a week and a half before Rosh Hashanah, so I can't Skip this source. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer says that in Tishrei the world was created. Rabbi Yoshua says that in Nisan the world was created. Perhaps this is the depth of the Machloket. If we're speaking about the objective truth, the universal objective truth of God from God's perspective, the world was created in Tishrei. If we're speaking about the human beings, then Am Yisrael was created in Nisan. So that's why Rabbi Yoshua says really in Nisan, the world was created. Okay, let's now go to the Gemara Erevin. The Gemara Erevin also quotes the, the verse Lo Bashamaimi. Rashi brings it on the spot in our parsha. He says, the Gemara Erevin, I'll say it orally, the Gemara Erevin says that they make an inference. It says, this mitzvah is not far. It is not in heaven that you need to climb in heaven. So the Moran makes an inference. That means that had it been in heaven, you, ha you would have had the obligation to climb to heaven. Thank God it was not, it's not in heaven. Torah is saying you have luck that it's not in heaven. But your commitment should be so strong, you should infer from here, that had it been in heaven, you're required to climb to heaven to get it. So the, so the inference that the sages are doing is something very demanding. Now, I was asking all the time, there's such a gap here between the temper of the oral Torah and the temper of, this, uh, of, of, of the written Torah and the temper of the sages here in the oral Torah, in the Gemara and Erevin. The written Torah says, it's calling us down. Look, it is not that hard. It is not an heaven. Don't worry. It's close to you. It's accessible. That's the temper, the mood of the written Torah. And look at what the sages make out of it in the Gemara and Erevin. Hey, you should infer from here that hadn't been in heaven, you're obligated and expected to climb to heaven. A very demanding statement. So how do we reconcile 
the mood of the written Torah here and the mood of the oral Torah here. So look at what the Sfatim is saying in our Parsha. In the name of his grandfather, the founder of the Gere Hasidus, Adoni Aviz Keni Hegid, on the verse Lova <coughs> Shamayim, <coughs> that one who wants with all his heart to cling to the Torah, even, and that means that even if it was in heaven, he would search after it, as Rashi here quotes in the name of the Gemara. One who is willing to do that, for him, it's really close. And everything is after the effort. <clears throat> it is getting closer to you till it gets very close to you that it seems that it was never distant from you. And without any effort, then it seems very far. Look at this deep statement and we'll conclude with that. Just like in relationships between husband and wife, a love story, something could seem very, very far. If you're willing to climb to heaven, then it's really close. Paradox here. The Sfat wisely reconciles the temper of the Torah Shebechtav and the Torah Shebechtav. It is not in heaven. It is accessible. It's close. You know when it will be easy for you? Accessible, close, not in heaven? If you will have the will, the effort, the energy, the mindset, if you're willing even to climb to heaven for that, you have the desire even to climb to heaven, you're willing to work hard to come close to Hashem. If you're saying, I'm willing to come close to Hashem, even if it requires for me of me to climb to heaven or to cross the ocean, if you're really being that thing, then it will become very, very easy. Everything will be very, very close. Then lo b'shamayim. So I think this is uh, my bracha for Rosh Hashanah, that we'll have Bezrat Hashem a happy year, a good year, a healthy year. That the year and its curses will pass, will, will be finished. A year will, 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 will start with its blessings. And our efforts now in Elul, Anile Dodi Vedodi Li, is to acknowledge the fact that the Torah is a Torah of human beings, not of angels. The, Torah, the tshuva is a human project. The tshuva is not an angel project. The tshuva is a human project. Hashem understands. Hashem understands that there is no righteous person that will never sin. And dafka because of that, we're required to give us biggest effort, to be willing to the biggest commitments. And if you will have that desire, then Believe it, you'll, you'll see that it's actually much, much more simple and much closer than you think. As Rabbi Yudha Alevi says in his song, I went out to get you, and I went, went, went out in order to greet you, then I found you coming close to me. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thank you. Thank you. When do we come back? At 10.45. Okay. At 10.45.